right? So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be around the world. Thank you very much for joining us to our eighth uh, installment of our webinar series. Um, this particular one is uh, titled Machine Learning for Cognitive State Classification. And really what we're going to be trying to answer today is what can machine learning tell us for, about you from your EEG? So that is uh, hopefully what we'll get through. We will be describing, talking about a number of physiological features, but I'll focus a lot on EEG um, and how we can process that, but we'll discuss other signal, physiological signals that can be used as well. So for those of you who don't know us, we are wearable sensing. We've been revolutionizing brain monitoring for the past uh, decade or more. Uh, we leverage uh, our, ourselves on breakthrough dry electro technology developed by a company called Quasar since the turn of the century. And we've been building real-world brain-computer interfaces uh, applications using this technology. So that's been mainly a mobile EEG system. And this is uh, just a few samples of the products we have uh, been selling. Those are EEG headsets that have dry electrodes that are easy to wear, comfortable for long-term use, and provide excellent signal quality that's comparable to that obtained with uh, research and medical-grade uh, EEG equipment. And those are currently available on the market. Uh, we have had other webinars where we've discussed those products, and you're welcome to watch those or uh, reach us, reach out to Cameron or myself after the webinar for more information. We also have a number of um, multimodal physiological sensors that go along, so from ECG for cardiac monitoring, EMG for muscle recording, EOG for ocular recordings, as well as the GSR for galvanic skin response recordings, respiration, skin temperature, as well as built-in 3D accelerometers. And we also have a headset that has integrated EEG in functional near infrared, FNIR, as well as uh, trans, uh, transcranial uh, electrical stimulation uh, integration with other companies and uh, motion tracking as well uh, through third-party collaborations and eye tracking. So all of this gives us a, a full multimodal wearable sensor suite that we can wear for extended periods of time and record excellent signal quality. Today I won't be talking very much in detail about the hardware. We're going to be talking about what do we do with all this data that we can record, and what can this data tell us about ourselves, the cognitive states that we are having. So to start, I will give a very, very short introduction about EEG. So for those of you who know this, bear with me. For those of you who don't, listen quickly, because it's going to go fast. EEG is the measurement of the electrical activity of the brain from the surface of the skull. When enough neurons close enough in, to proximity in each other, to each other and align in, in, in parallel way, fire together, you get postsynaptic potential, so that's the response to the action potential, of the postsynaptic potential, that can sum in, in time and space, creating local field potential. When those local field potentials are large enough, they can spread through the tissue of the brain and all the way across the dura, across the skull, across the scalp, and we can record them. Those signals end up being very, very small on the orders of microvolts. And so what we have to do typically is you have to abrade the skin, remove the layer of, uh, layer of dead cells, and put some gel and put some electrodes and glue this on to get these signals. The innovation we bring forth is that we do not need to rub the skin, we do not need to put any gels, and we can get the same signal quality. Again, you can see another webinar for how our techno that technology works. Here I'm going to focus on EEG signals. So this, on the next figure here, this graph shows us what EEG signals look like. So this is um, an aroused uh, state, meaning somebody is alert, paying attention. This is what your EEG would look like, hopefully, right now. Um, if you close your eyes, you'll get these alpha spindles. Uh, that's your default mode network that's synchronizing. And when you start falling asleep, those alpha waves disappear and turn into faster spindles. Um, and when you go to deep sleep, they, they actually slow down and they increase in amplitude, and this is uh, called slow-wave sleep. So just by looking at the morphology of the signal, um, medical practitioners can stage sleep. That's just how they stage sleep. They tell you whether, how much time you've spent in REM sleep versus uh, deep sleep versus lighter sleep, etc. 
When we do real-time uh, analysis or when you're doing trying to get quantitative measures of EEG to try to get a cognitive state, we're typically not looking visually. So we tend to look at the EEG features in a different domain. And one of the those domains is looking at the spectral uh, power. So spectral power or Fourier domain is when we look at the frequency, at the power and the frequency range. So typically for EEGs, we've broken them down into different bands. So we have delta band between 0 to 4 hertz, theta between 4 to 8 hertz, alpha 8 to 12 hertz, beta 12 to 30 hertz, and gamma 30 hertz. So those relate initially to the order in which those brain waves were discovered, but also to functional relationships of those activities to brain areas. So specific brain areas, when they are active in different types of activities, will have different uh, frequency uh, patterns. And those can give us some insight to what's going on. So that's why we tend to group them in these bands. We can also see different uh, neurological disorders affect different bands in different areas. So that, that's why they're looked at this way. There are a number of other features and other ways to look at EEG signals. I will touch on some of those just bare, barely in passing, but today I'm going to focus mainly on spectral features. All right, so that's the EEG 101 course. Uh, hopefully you guys all got that real fast. Now I'm going to talk about cognitive states. What are cognitive states? A cognitive state, uh, so we can get into a long discussion debate about what they really mean, and there's lots of people make their careers in doing that. I, I won't delve that deeply. I'm going to define a cognitive state at the most basic level, with, with which hopefully we can all agree. A cognitive state is a state of your brain uh, that when it's doing a particular task, such as if it's um, working hard, uh, it could be working a little, not so hard or working very hard, that would be called workload. Engagement would be when we are thinking, um, attending to something or not attending to something. People call that attention. Um, then we have um, fatigue, cognitive fatigue. Uh, there are people that may look at the arousal of the brain. So are you excited about something? Some people may look at valence. Some people may look at neurological disorders. Are you uh, suffering from ADHD? So those may be more of states rather than uh, traits. Uh, those may be more traits instead of states. Uh, but that's still something that we can tell from the EG signal about the person. We can look at anxiety. We can look at depression. We can look at uh, a number of uh, things that might happen. So anything that's happening inside your brain typically on a, on a steady uh, state on a, on a longer time basis than an immediate action, that's what we're defining here very loosely as a cognitive state. So how are those usually assessed? There's two general categories, empirical and analytical. On the empirical side, meaning we're using data, um, the, the most basic one would be to derive the measurements from direct or indirect, to derive the assessment from direct or indirect measurements. So this could be a behavioral assessment. We can see what is the person doing. Does it look like they're thinking? Does it look like they're phasing out? Does it look like they're excited? We can also give them a particular task or a battery of cognitive tasks to assess uh, what's happening there. We can give them a cognitive task and, and kind of give them some problems to solve and that so we know that we're engaging specific brain areas. And we can look at their performance. So that gives us a direct or indirect measurement of their state. We can also use psychophysiological measures, and that's going to be the crux of today's talk. Uh, you can use EEG, functional near infrared, GSR, ECG, heart rate variability, EOG, and even pupillometry to get a sense, and, and others, to get a sense of what is happening inside your brain. Now, none of these techniques are perfect, and I'm not going to tell you which one is the best one or which one is uh, you know, better suited for one task. There are a number of trade-offs between them. They have to do with how complex it is to uh, set up, how costly it is, how sensitive it might be, how specific it might be. And so those are going to be trade-offs that you might uh, exper experience uh, experiments with and determine what is suitable for your specific uh, task and kind of state that you're interested in. For ourselves, uh, since we do have all this hardware, we often tend to start with everything. We'll put everything on our, our subjects in a pilot study and we'll record uh, from all the sensors we can, and then we'll do uh, the construction, a, a task uh, where we spend the time to select the least amount of sensors that give us the most sensitivity or most specificity for what we're interested in. And again, there will be trade-offs in wearability, long-term long wearability, et cetera. So those are psychophysiological measures. There are also subjective methods where you can ask the person, 
hey, how do you feel? What are you thinking? What's going on inside your brain? And so there are some standardized ways of doing that. So for workload, people might use the NASA task load index or the SWOT analysis. So those are just some subjective methods of asking the person what's going on. On the analytical side, that means that we are going to create a model of some sort that assesses what the person is doing based upon a certain set of assumptions. So for example, I'm driving. We can do a task decomposition on my driving and determine, okay, now you're driving in a straight line, so you're not thinking too hard. Now you got to an interse a busy intersection, you're looking left, right, you're looking at signs, you're looking at the red light, there's pedestrians, you might be at a higher workload. So you can model any different task breakdown and, and sum them up and run them in computer simulations and you can see the task load of a, of a person at a particular time. So again, people usually will tend to use as many methods as they can to convert because none of them by itself is perfect. So you try to bring in as many modalities and build a story from the aggregation of your data and, and analysis methods. So that's cognitive states at a high level. Now let's dig into how we do it. So, but before I do, I just want to show you an example of that running in, in real time. So uh, this here subject is doing these math problems that you see on his screen and blown up over here. So he just did a first one column addition task. He got it right in 2.4 seconds. On the right side is his EEG. And here in the middle is the output of our cognitive uh, State, a cognitive state gauge, which we call Q state. First column is engagement. So this person is paying attention to the task, he's highly attentive, and he's got a high engagement load. The workload, next two bars are workload. So I'll explain later the difference between those two. For now, there's these two are workload. And he's solving these pretty quickly in two seconds. He's not concentrating a lot. Oh, now it got hard, and his attention went down. Notice that engagement went down. And his workload is starting to go up, but he got it incorrect. So most likely that was due to his loss of attention uh, for a little bit. Now he's paying attention again. His workload is going up. And we'll give him a few seconds to solve this. He has to solve this in his head before he types the answer. And he got, it took him 13 seconds and he got it correct. Now the questions are getting easy again. And you can see the mental workload is going down. But this good student is still paying attention to the task. So I'm going to let this video run, and you can see that if I was to just look at the EEG, I'm not going to be visually able to discern whether he's thinking hard or not. So that's why we need some kind of machine learning algorithm to interpret this EEG data and give us this kind of nuanced output that's telling us what's happening on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. So we can also look at this um, as a time course, and when we, afterwards we can analyze this data. So this is the output from this particular recording. So you can see there were three easy problems. So sorry, on the x-axis is time. On the y-axis is the output of the mental workload gauges. So the higher it is, the higher the mental workload is. So we can see the first three bumps were the first three easy math problems, followed by two hard problems where the workload went higher, followed by three easy ones. And you can see they're not all equally easy. This one maybe have been a little harder than the next two. And then there's two hard ones and three easy ones, two hard ones, three easy ones, two hard ones, three easy ones. So you can see that we can really track very nicely how hard the task is by looking at the EEG-based output that is derived by this Q state. And we'll be descri describing how this Q state algorithm works in a little bit. But I just want to show you how it could run in real time and how we can look at the analysis afterwards. So we get a sense. What is it that we're talking about? What are these things called cognitive states? In this case, the cognitive states that I'm looking at, one of them is engagement, how attentive are you? And the other two are workloads. And I'll describe the difference between these two. All right, so at this point, I'm going to take my first set of questions and see if there are any questions uh, so far. So I wanna make sure that we're all understood a little bit the basics of the EEG, how we're recording this a little bit, and what we're expecting to get. Any questions on that so far before we dig into how this algorithm works? So just as a reminder, feel free to, if you do have any questions, type them in the Q&A or in the chat. We do have a few questions from the Q&A. The first one is, how do you define cognitive states? Is it dependent on the task, uh, such as end back easy or end back hard? 
Yeah, fantastic. So uh, the cognitive state is going to be that is going to be up to you and your papers that you're reading to use your definition. So in the case that we're seeing over here, we have decided that a high, we're looking at the mental workload, and we decided that a high mental workload is when they're doing these three column additions, which is one you're seeing on the screen, and we decided that the easy column additions that you're seeing here, those are the low mental workloads. So what we do, what we'll do is we'll record a set of data about a minute long of easy tasks, easy math problems, and we'll, and we'll save that file, and we call that the low state training file. And then we'll record one minute of data of the high state training file, and we'll call that uh, high state uh, training data. And uh, then we'll give those to the machine learning algorithm and we'll let it learn and we'll describe in a second how it does that. And then it will have a model. And that model we will call our mental workload for arithmetic problem. If I wanted to do a mental workload for um, arousal, oh, sorry, a, a gauge for arousal while watching movies, I would decide which movies I think are going to be my low state and which ones are going to be my high state make a set, present them to train, et cetera. So you get to define what is a high state and you get to define what is a low state. The most important part is to have clean data for training the low state and clean data for training the high state so that your model knows those and to validate those states with some additional ground truth. So we can't just say three column addition is hard and one column addition is easy. We need to try to validate that. We can look at the performance. We can look at how much time did it take you to respond to these. We can ask you, did you feel this is hard or not? We can get some math experts and say, hey, does this look harder to you than that? We can look at a plurality of things to get a measurement and an assessment. You can do a secondary task at the same time to try to get a sense of remaining uh, processing capability. So you, it is up to you to find ways to get as many ground truths as possible that will help you strengthen the case for what is the low state and what is the high state. Um, next question, it's a uh, one question with three questions. Uh, what width of time are you looking at when you grab the data? How many channels of the data are you monitoring? And do we have any visual depiction of the spectral features? Okay, great question. So I will be digging very deeply into how we analyze the data, um, the, the features uh, and the time course of all of that. So uh, I'll defer that to just a few seconds. I'll answer that. Uh, the, uh, so I'll answer all parts of these questions uh, in a little bit, Cameron. All right. Um, next question is, um, what is the difference between the two workload measures, MVN, PDF versus linearized? Okay. Um, again, so maybe I, I will proceed to describe the methodology of this algorithm, and, and we will get into details of the difference between the uh, two uh, output, the MVN PDF, and the um, linearized output. So I'll, I'll describe those in a second. All right. Um, sounds good. Um, so did you want to take a few more questions, or did you want to keep moving forward? So I'm looking here. I think I can answer this one. Can this classification perform between subjects? That's a great question, and I'm going to be showing you the differences um, between uh, an individual model, a, norm, uh, a norm, model that's designed for each individual, and models designed for um, for groups, which we call norm, uh, norm, normative models. And we'll describe how you know some people may be similar and some people may not be, and the, the advantages of doing individualized training. So I think of that. I think I will move forward because I think most of the questions I will be answering in a second. So rather than um, uh, I was looking if anybody had any questions about the uh, the high level questions so far, but I think they're excited to dig in deeper. So let me dig into the deeper side. All right, so we're going to cover the, the the basics and the depths of the algorithm that we're describing. Uh, here, I'm, I should mention that I'm focusing on QState, which is the software and algorithms that we've developed here at Wearable Sensing and with. with at Quasar, actually, and that we have implemented at wearable sensing, those are not the only solution, not the only way to do this. That's just one of the ways in which you can do a cognitive state classification. And I'm not saying that this is the best or making any judgments on others. I'm just presenting you as one methodology as, as an example. 
Okay, so when I joined the Quasar, I had a neuroscience background. They had just developed this hardware, and they had this cognitive state gauges that they had just developed, and I was a little surprised that you could measure mental workloads from EEG. I had not heard about that in graduate school. So I asked, and they said, well, we're actually not sure. And so we spent a whole lot of time. Um, I, I was given the task of spending a whole, figuring out how this worked and how it's related to other people's work. So I read a lot in literature, and lo and behold, there's quite a bit of work in, what the, in a field called neuroergonomics, which was looking at how can we me determine how hard the brain is working from looking at EG or other physiological measures. And so when I started to look at the data that we're recording, I started to see that those, there were some trends that indeed were published and people knew about. I just hadn't learned about them. So here I'll show you some examples of recording. So we recorded uh, some EEG data in a low state. And low state in this case might have been either a person looking at a blank screen or, um, or doing a very easy uh, task. And we can, when we look at this uh, view here, what we're looking at on the x-axis is the frequency. We're looking here in the Fourier domain, this frequency on the x-axis. On the y-axis, it's power. So this is a detrended PSD, power spectral density, and it's detrended just so we can see it uh, in an easy way. Um, there isn't a negative power. So what I see here, I see a big peak around 12 hertz. So this is the alpha band, and it's normal, as we described, that when you relax, and you will have a big peak, an uh, increase in power there. And we can see a, a downward trend in the beta uh, relative to the alpha. So this would be the low state. When we gave the person a difficult task, uh, such as a difficult math problem I just showed you, we can see that the alpha peak here dropped, and the beta went from this negative to it went up. And some EMG and so some high frequency features here um, have elevated in power. So just visually, if I had to determine whether a person is in a high state or low state, I could say, okay, let me look at their spectral power and decide, looking by the alpha and beta, what they're doing. And, when I, and so that's, that's what I would do visually. And when we give the um, computer, and we'll be describing the algorithms in a second, when we give it the, the ability to do this, to look at the features and to determine which features it should look at, it sets weight. It would say, okay, this is where I should pay attention. And so here is what it would give us. So here are the weights that our models are going to give us. It's going to put a lot of weight on ALF on this power band. Say, hey, look, I can tell the difference between high state and low state by looking, by looking a lot most at alpha and by looking also at the beta power and also by looking at the high frequency. I can tell what is going on. I can make a prediction based upon that. So this was encouraging. This is telling us that this methodology that I'll be describing to you in a little bit does indeed track what I see by eye as separable features and is setting weights accordingly. So I'm going to be getting now in real depth but how exactly do we do that? How is the algorithm looking at this changes between features and setting weights that relate to that? And then later I'll show you the output. So in this case, in the low state, uh, the output was mostly low, not all low. Notice there are some spikes. And in the high state, it is mostly high. But again, not all high. There are some spikes that go down. So our brain isn't in a perfectly steady state. There are spikes that go down. But if you look at overall, this is overall high state, this is overall low state. All right, so here's an overview of how the al our algorithm works. So first, uh, we have to collect the data, and this could be EEG data, it could be FNIR data, or it could be a number of other physiological data streams. So this could be FNIRs, ECG, EMG, EOG, respiration, skin temperature, galvanic skin response, or others. We have incorporated those into our QSpace. The data is acquired by some software. It can either be output into a file for offline processing, or we can pass it uh, for real-time analysis. We then calculate vertical and horizontal EOG channels. So the vertical uh, EOG is the movement of the eye and this uh, axis, and horizontal is horizontal movement, and those can produce artifacts in the EOG. So we derive either from dedicated EOG electrodes or from electrodes in the forehead, we will derive some features, which we will be using to regress those artifacts from the EEG. Then we have a number of different preprocessors, one for each one of the features. So we'd have an EEG, an EOG, an EMG, et cetera. Each one of them will have a preprocessor, which I'll describe a little bit for some of those. 
What, from those preprocessors, they're going to provide us features from each of those different modalities. And then we'll group all of those features into a feature vector, which we can then use to train a classifier. When we have a feature vector from a low state and a high state or two different states, we can use those data to train a classifier. And if we are conversely collecting the data to analyze in real time or offline, we can, we have a model, so we have already trained our classifier model, we can then pass them for classification. And there are a number of steps in doing that. So that's the overall view. Now let's dig into some pre-processing. So let's going to dig most deeply into the EEG. So the first thing we do to our EEG is we split the data into two second epochs. And it's not really exactly two seconds, it's a little bit more than two seconds because we're going to apply some filtering and we need to have room for the filter ring up. Then we uh, separate the EOG channels and we apply a low pass filtering on them and we use those EOG channels to regress the EOG artifacts from the EG data. So again, EOG artifacts are these uh, very large artifacts that come from the eye moving in, our, in the socket and, and affect all EG recordings and we need to remove them in order to see just the EEG data. We can also, we then uh, cut off the uh, ends of the two second epoch. So we have the just two second epoch. And um, the next thing we do is we take these measurements to derive noise metrics, which we'll use later. I'll show you how we use those. Then we take all the data and we re-reference it. So what does re-referencing mean? So typically when you acquire EEG data, it's in relation to one reference. So every EEG measurement is a measurement between two points. When we re-reference, we get all the other possible combinations of electrodes, uh, vectors, to, to each other, and we calculate those. That produces, a, from 21 electrodes, that produces a large number of vectors. We then take um, all of these vectors and we calculate the digital Fourier transforms, so DFT. So this is where we go into the um, Fourier domain, we get the frequency and the power and the frequency. Um, and we do that for each of the bin, the one hertz bins, and we also do that for the frequency band. And we can also get some additional noise metrics over here. At this point, we have all the features that we want, and we construct our EEG epoch vector. So that's what we do for the EEG. Now we have the pre-processed data. So for every two seconds, we'll have approximately 20,000 features of EEG because of this combination, this multiplication of features that we got to each of the re-reference data. So we'll have, for every two seconds, we'll have 20,000 features, one row. Then for EOG. So for EOG, we also derived some features. We found those to be useful, for example, for fatigue monitoring. So one example is we have the a measure of the percentage of time that the eye is in the closed state as opposed to the open state. So for how long, essentially, is a blink lasting? And as you get tired, that gets longer. So we can, we can use this as a measure of fatigue. We also look at the RMS and the EOG vectors. Tells us how fast somebody's blinking, which if they're stressed, they may be blinking faster. For EMG, we have a separate preprocessor, and that we can use the, e, the data from the EG headset. So facial features such as the frowning or smiling or a jaw tension or neck tension will show some EEG data, AMG data in the EEG channel. So we can extract that. We can also have dedicated EMG sensors placed elsewhere on the body or on the face or on the arms or legs to get additional measures of EMG. We apply some specific filtering. We cut the data into two-second epochs. We re-reference only basically to, to work with each other if we're doing bipolar or to a central location on the head if we want to get some facial EMG. We do the Fourier transform, and now we have the power and the EG band, the uh, power of EMG that's in the EG band, meaning um, underneath the 40 hertz, and then power outside the EG band, which is above 70 hertz. And then we construct the EMG epoch vector. So that will be the number of features um, that depends on the number of channels that we have. So I won't go into details of all the other pre-processing. I'm just going to let you know that for a few states, we have 58 EEG features, which gets multiplied times all the channel re-referencing. So you can see there's, in this case here, if we have 21 channels, we'll have all these different re-references, we'll have all these different features, and we have a whole lot more that I'm not showing on the screen. Those are, the ones I'm showing on the screen are all frequency-based. We also have some features that are entropy-based, some that are phase lag-based or phase locking-based. 
And all those features uh, tie into those 58 features and times the number of channels. And that's how we get this uh, 28,000 uh, features. Um, then for the EOG, we have three features. EMG, we have two features. ECG, we have 14 heart rate variability features. So people think of heart rate variability as one uh, feature. It's not. There are many ways to calculate heart rate variability. It depends on whether you're looking at high frequency variability or low frequency variability. So we have uh, 14 statistical measures of heart rate variability. We have uh, eight features of uh, functional near infrared that are derived after we calculate the oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin and the blood volume. And then we have uh, 15 statistical galvanic skin response features and three synthetic ones and four non-synthetic ones. We have seven features for skin temperature, four features for the accelerometer, and three features for respiration. So all of these, depending on which sensors you have, QState is going to derive these features for you and put them all into its epoch. So that's what we call an epoch. It's going to take all this data and extract the features for each of the different uh, sensor modalities and put them in two sec every two seconds, you'll have one data point. Now, some of them, some of the heart rate variabilities, need a lot of seconds, uh, sometimes like some of them need at least 20 seconds to start building up the first feature, but then it updates every two seconds. All right, so once we have the epoch um, and we can start, now we can start training models. So first thing we need to do to train a model, we need to collect some data. So this is what I mentioned earlier. We need to have a very clean low state data. Clean low state data, meaning whatever you define to be your low state, we need at least one minute of data of that. So typically, we'll start recording a few seconds before you start doing the task. And let, sorry, we let you start doing the task a few seconds before we start recording, and we record one minute, and then we move you on to the, the other state task, do the hard task for a few seconds, then we start recording, and then we get another uh, one minute recording of that. It's very important to have clean ground truth for that, as I mentioned. So get uh, as many ground truths as you can, so that you can validate that this is truly a hard state task and this is really a low state task, high versus low. So you need to define those. So now let's go back and look at uh, what we're doing. So we have the physiological data. We've pre-processed it. We have our ve vector of ground truth. This is where we use the noise metrics. So for training data, it's important for us to reject noise epochs. We don't want to have a whole lot of noise uh, from jaw clenching or other things that we're not interested in or somebody sneezed, you don't want to have a model trying to learn about sneezing when it's a model about workload. If you want to create a model about sneezing, great. Sneeze for one minute straight, use that data to train the model about sneezing. But if you're not trying to sneeze, then we want to reject the epochs that may have sneezing, which will have a lot of high noise artifacts. So that's where we reject the, the noisy epochs. Uh, then we have a feature selection which is um, which is where the uh, partial least squared, no, not yet. So then we, uh, the feature selection, that's where we select which features are going to be used. We have a few important steps here, which are the feature initialization, where we do some uh, feature smoothing, some column centering, some normalization. So that's basically a lot of um, manipulations on the data that allow us to do our partial least squared analysis, which is how we're going to train the model. So those are important steps. I won't cover them in detail here. If you're interested, we can happily answer those questions uh, to, to you separately. Uh, but the point is that we are doing some pre-processing on the data to arrange it to make it ready for the algorithm. Now, what is the algorithm? We are using a partial least squared algorithm, PLS. Why? People often ask us, why aren't you using a support vector machine? Why aren't you using a neural network? Why aren't you using this? Why aren't you using that? There is no right and wrong answer. But here are the reasons why we chose partial least squared. As I mentioned, we have about 20,000 or more, 28,000 features or so for each two-second epoch. And we want to have the least amount of training data. This often causes the problem of overfitting your data. Partial least squares is a good approach that handles very well these high feature, these large numbers of features and with small amounts of data. So, that's one of the reasons why we use partial least squared. Other reason we like to use partial least squared is when we look back at the weights that the partial least squared algorithm uses, we can actually determine which features had the largest contributions. As I showed you a little bit earlier, 
I could see that there were weights on the alpha band. I could see there were weights on the beta band. And that's very useful if I'm going to go publish my work and say, okay, my, al my magical algorithm told me this is my workload. Well, how did it do it? We can say, well, I look at the feature weights and I see that put in a lot of weights on this particular feature or put in a lot of weights on that particular feature. That can help me tie into the understanding of the neurophysiology that's happening and that can help other people replicate our, uh, your, your work and, and understand and better get a deeper sense of understanding about how this cognitive state is being determined and, and analyzed. So for those two reasons, we really like the partial least squared. As well as it works really well and it's quite fast and it works in real time. A whole lot of reasons. Not to say anything bad about the other ones, just explaining why this one works well for us. So if the PLS generates a weights matrices and, and covariances, and that's how the model ends up running. And then we have a very important step, which is where we deflate uh, to keep the most salient features. So we do something called MRMR, which is minimal redundancy, maximal relevance. I won't, get in I won't go into the details of that, but that's um, an approach to help us keep the features that are the most relevant but at the same time, eliminate some redundancy. And this is very important, otherwise, again, you can fall back into overfitting of the data. So we, ha we get rid of all of that, so from the 20-some thousand features, we can go down to several hundreds or perhaps a thousand you can, have, you can set, uh, depending on your settings of for your particular task. So that's how we train models. Now we have a model that's trained and ready, it has there's the weight matrices. Now we can classify, start classifying. So when we go to classify, we do the same thing. We collect the data that comes in, it gets pre-processed, and you get the epoch vectors. And now we can apply noise metrics if we want to or not. We can decide to let it classify and see what happens. We can reject the epochs or flag them. We do some feature smoothing. We uh, have the selected features that happen uh, in the model. And then we do additional column centering and normalization. And then we can pass that to start the classification of the data. We classify the data in two ways. Uh, one is an MVN PDF output, and the other one is a linearized output. So I'm going to describe those two different methods at a very high level. Uh, if you're interested in the math, again, reach out to us, and we'll be happy to get more deeply into it. At a very high level, what is the difference? MVN PDF stands for Multivariate Normalized Probability Density Function. And what that means is we take the training data and we assume a certain normalized distribution. So here in this plot on the right, you can see uh, in purple, you can see the distribution of little blue dots and the purple dots here. And there are some green dots hidden be behind those uh, blue dots that are the training data dots. And those um, ovals are the, distri the distribution um, lines based upon the uh, MVN PDF. So those functions allow us to draw uh, an intersection between them. And when you have intersections of two normal distributions, you get a sigmoid, which is a very steep function. And that function allows us to do very nicely discrimination between two states. So something is going to be either in a high state or a low state, and there's going to be a nice transition between them. So we like to use that output when we want to know, hey, are you in state A or state B? So for example, we'll say engagement. Are you engaged or not engaged? That's when we'll tend to use the MPN PDF output. Sometimes we want to know how hard is it, how, how much of a state are you in. So for example, for workload, I want to know, are you thinking very hard or are you not thinking very hard? And how hard are you thinking? So for that, we use a linearized output. And there what we do is, again, here in the training data is illustrated in red, and the other low state training data is illustrated in blue. And we take the centroid of these distributions we draw a line between them. And when a new data point comes, and this is in latent vector space, sorry. So all those features get, uh, get multiplied times the weight matrices, and we go into the latent vector, which has two dimensions, latent vector one, latent vector two. And we plot each, uh, for each uh, epoch, we get uh, one point, and we can drop that point, uh, the, the orthogonal, uh, to the ortho so we can drop that point along its orthogonal to the um, line connecting the two centroids and we see where it crosses. And depending on where it crosses, uh, we can see the distance between the low state and the high state, where the high state would be one, low state is zero, and we see where that crossed the line, and that's the value. So in this case, it might be around 60, or it came down here, it might be 80, and that's what we say, okay, so they are 80% workload. So it's not exact, but it gives us a way to get a sense of on a more linear scale of what's happening. 
And I'll show you some sample data output of, of how these two models output. So this is the output of our data. And when we look at these, the, the, this, is the out, this is how QSAFE gives us outputs. And this is where I was showing you earlier. This is the, the purple and the brown where the linearized and the MBN PDF outputs. And you can see that in the case of the column addition, they were lining up pretty nicely. There might be some places where they diverge a little bit, but overall they tend to usually line up pretty well with one another. But we'll get, we typically get a little bit better resolution uh, in the linearized for when we have variants. And you'll see some more examples of that. Okay, so all this math makes it sound like QSAFE is very hard to use, and it's not. Uh, so here I'm just going to show you just a few screen captures of how easy QSAFE is. It's very few buttons on the surface. Um, it asks you to select the training model, uh, select, uh, you select the training file, and it creates a model. And at the end, it gives you some kind of measure of cross-validation of that model. So it gives you a sense of how good this model might work. And then the output is very simple for each model. It can create up to three models at a time. You get an output file, and you can see in this case this was a high state file, so you can see the outputs. You can see how different the linearized from the NV and PDF outputs are. And there's a summary, so you can have many files here. Here I just had one file, and you have I had only one model. But you can have multiple models, multiple files. You get summaries. You can export all of that. That's at the easy user level, right? This is like I don't want to dig deep, but if you want, this is a gray box. You can unravel it. We can unravel and show you all the ways, all the features. You can dig into your heart's delight, do your own statistics, do your own analysis. And we have some users that do that. And I'll show you an example of that later. So I just wanted to show you this is QState. That's the algorithm. That's how it works. And that's the interface. Now I'll take some questions on, uh, that haven't been answered already, hopefully, uh, about the algorithms before I jump into some of the applications and how people and ourselves have been using it. So I just want to make sure that we um, answered the questions that had been asked initially. So just making sure we talked about the time at what we're looking to grab the data, how many channels we're monitoring the visual depiction of the spectral features. Sure. So at the time, uh, so you can record as long as you want. Uh, the training files, we recommend at least one minute of data. Um, the more, the better. But of course, there's a trade-off between having too long of trainings and you spend all your time training. Um, and uh, the, the resolution is two seconds for, our Q, for the way we are running two states right now. And that's just because of the nature we're wanting to look at low frequency uh, data points. If you're using um, different uh, physiological measures, you could change it. For example, for heart rate variability, as I mentioned, some of the features take at least 20 seconds to ramp up, so you need, you'll need that. But then we can update them on a two second by two second epoch. Currently, Q states is really running at two seconds. If you really wanted to run at a different frequency, that we can customize that, but that's um, additional work. Uh, how many features? Uh, I showed the numbers of features there, and that those really depend on the number of sensors uh, that you have on the EEG headset. So that's why I'm, I'm throwing this number at about over 28,000 features. If you were just looking at a 21 channel EEG headset, if you had a smaller number of channels, um, you'll have less features. Next question. Just got a question. Um, what are your thoughts on using deep learning for classification? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, at the moment here with the PLS, we were not using any specific deep learning. We're not, allow you know, we not allowing it to self-train and, and learn on its own. Uh, there are a number of people doing that. There are people that are showing amazing results with that. Um, I'm amazed at, uh, you know, a couple years back before um, I was a little skeptical. Now I've seen what some people have been doing amazing stuff with deep learning. I think the most important challenge is really to run adequate validations and, and, and really believe um, there, are, there are actually uh, ISO standards for validating mental workload assessments. And you can apply those to other kinds of states. Those look at um, accuracy, sensitivity, um, diagnosticity, um, and, and, and a number of levels that you can get in resolution. So you can, you can follow these ISO standards to really uh, validate your data. And when you do and you get a good uh, reliability, I think there's no reason why not to do 
uh, deep learning method. You just have to be careful how to interpret the data that you're getting and, and how you're feeding it. And I've been impressed with what some people have done. All right, uh, one more question. Does ICA have any relationship to these procedures you just mentioned? Great question. So we are not using ICA for a few different reasons. Um, one, ICA um, tends to affect the phase relationships between different channels, so we don't like that for some of the features that we're using. Um, I see some people use ICA for uh, denoising and removing of artifacts. Some people use it for actual feature identification, and, and that, those could all be fine. Uh, we also don't like it very much because um, it doesn't. It, once it gets involved into the ICA space, you cannot necessarily trace back which features um, were really the essential ones, which areas of the brain were essentially the, the, the sensitive ones. So we we don't like that loss of data. But there are some people that really value it and, and use it in a clever ways to get back some of this information. So we're not doing ICA here, not to say that it cannot be done or others aren't doing it. Uh, next question we just got, uh, how many features will be left after feature selection? So in feature selection, that's where you get to select which features you have. And so that's where I showed this, um, this nice window that pops up at one point. If you have an advanced uh, user mode, you can kind of select which features you wanted to use and which ones you don't want to use it. So you can select as few as two or three, um, or you can select all of them. And then depending on how many channels you have, uh, you know, getting cross uh, re-referenced. Uh, so this array gets multiplied times all the features that are here, and this is only showing the spectral features. Um, so that's, uh, you, this array gets multiplied times 58, and that's how you get uh, a lot of the features. All right, I think that covers all the questions for that section. All right, thank you guys. So I do have a few minutes left, so I'm going to try to go uh, quickly through the applications to leave you some more time uh, to ask me questions. But I do want to kind of cover them a little bit. I think it's important to understand what people are doing today with the cognitive state and what are some of the potential. So uh, a big section is using cognitive state tends to be doing psychologists trying to understand the brain or on the applied space, uh, neuromarketing. So this would be where people are trying to understand uh, gaming design, they want to know are, how engaged are you in the game, um, are you enjoying the game, how difficult is it for you. And the reason why it's important to do a cognitive state for this case, you want to know during the time, the entire time course of the game. You don't want to just ask at the end of the game. You want to know what were you doing when the mental workload was high. You want to be able to have a resolution at different time points in the game and see when are you enjoying it, when are you not. And same for movies, film, advertisement browsing the web, uh, you may want to see, you know, where is the person looking at when they felt happy? When, where was they uh, paying attention to? What were they doing when uh, they felt that this was too difficult? We also have some people using our hardware uh, and, and Q-States and uh, determine, uh, trying to assess how you feel in, in, our, in the different architectural environments and different garden states. So there's some you know, ways to look at things that may be harder to quantify uh, subjectively by speaking, but they, you can quantify them by looking at brain state. I'll give you some examples a little bit about how it can be used in adaptive teaching, uh, attention monitoring. I'll talk about examples of how it can be used as biomarkers. There's a lot of interest a while back in assessing vertigo during VR, uh, assessing gaming during VR, uh, but there's some, some things where you might want to get an immediate response back so you can do something about it. And there's uh, the field of augmented cognition, which built upon neuroergonomics, and this is sort of adaptive human-machine interfaces. So if we can see your brain in real time and kind of help change the environment for you, that can maybe adapt. And I'll show you some examples of those. Uh, the first example shows a, a very simple uh, neuromarketing experiment here. We, can, we have a person looking at a blind cardboard, eyes open. Well, that's what EO stands for. They have a video of a very boring math lecture and some very exciting sports footage, and we can see the uh, output of uh, arousal for this person. This was an arousal model. Um, so you can see where they're just staring at the uh, cardboard, they're, they're low state. The math, here's where you can see the nice separation between the linearized output and the MVN PDF. So the math here is showing us a nice intermediate state, but the MVN PDF is saying, hey, this is still pretty boring. Um, and then the excited sports, you can see they're quite excited. The MVN PDF just kind of shot through the roof. 
and the linearized kind of shows you a little bit more um, gradation. And then there's again some math. I don't know why they got excited about this math section. Maybe they were happy that it was almost ending. I'm not sure. And then there is the uh, eyes open, and then there is the uh, sports and eyes open. So you can see we can track this kind of arousal. So this is nice, and you can do this if you had some specific tasks. Um, there's a company that we work with called CA Ergo. They've developed software called Neuralab that really helps in this uh, field. So you can wrap videos, you can wrap websites, you can have it even in a mobile environment. It can track eye tracking, galvanic skin response, the EEG outputs, facial expressions. Bring them all into one space so you can do the experimental presentation, do the data collection all in one place, and then it generates nice reports that give you, for example, hey, you were looking at this point of so much, or your arousal state was so high when you were looking at this point. So it's a nice tool for neuromarketers who want to use cognitive states in, in looking at these things. Here's an example where we did use Neurolab, and again, we had two states running, and so here they watched boring videos or exciting videos of people jumping with wingsuits and water fighting, fog dissipating, and then again, di diving to your death practically. So very exciting versus um, boring videos, and you can see the tracking on key states tracks very nicely. I'm going to spend a little bit of time describing this task here. This is a, a very nice example of workload where I can show you the difference between a normative model and an individualized model. So this task here is a person playing a shooting game because this was funded by the Army, and uh, we can set the difficulty. So either you have eyes open where you're staring at a blank screen, or you have a number of enemies. So B0 means zero enemies, and one, one enemy, B3, three enemies, B5, five enemies. So we can increase the task difficulty by increasing the number of enemies. And again, we can do many ground truths. We can see performance, how many are you shooting, how many times did you get shot. We can ask you how hard it was. We can have a subject matter expert review your video, see how hard you're playing. We had a secondary task. Uh, we asked the subject as well. So we did a lot of ground truths to determine what was really hard for each individual. Um, and that's what we use for training. So we use for training here, we gave few states a separate file that was recorded when they played with zero enemies versus a separate file when they played with five enemies. And we used that to train the workload model. And when we, we had 18 subjects from this, and when we trained a normative model, meaning we gave all the data from the 18 subjects and we created this model, we got this blue line output. And you can see it's tracking difficulty, but you can see huge error bars across the individual. When we allowed to create one model for each individual using their pre-task training, we got this red line. You can see it has much better sensitivity than the blue line, and the error bars are much smaller. In a drift calibration, what we did is we did a training session at the beginning of the task and a training session at the end of the task, and this was a four-hour long task. So we had two training sessions that we used to train, and so this model allows us to adjust for any drift that may happen in the, subject, in the person's physiology. And you see it has even better separation and smaller error bars. So that's what a drift calibration would help you do. We typically don't do drift calibration. We find that the individual calibration is good enough, but it's really helpful. The other thing I'm not showing here is that you would need to train a different model for a different task. So I'm using a model trained for this task. I'm not using the column addition model on this task. It doesn't work as well as a model trained on this task. It's not the same brain areas that will be activated when you're playing a game as when you're solving math problems. It's not the same brain area that's going to be responding when you're watching videos. So you do need to create a task that's relevant to each individual, to, to the task. Those are, that's your training set. On the engagement, we created a model where we used the MVN PDF output. And here what we did is we took the eyes open versus both the easy and the hard task, and we trained the model. And now what we, see, what we get is indeed the low state, uh, the eyes open are low, and all the other things are going to get classified as high. So that's how we get an engagement model. It's not that there was something defined as engagement. We defined it by giving Q-State training files. We gave it these training files. We called it engagement because we thought we interpret that. Okay, we got muted suddenly. Um, so. So my time is up, so I need to hurry through to finish this for you guys. Thank you for your attendance. Um, 
So the important part here is that you can see a difference between the individual and normative models. And we can look at that in Q states. You can look at the, oh, this is the classification overall. We get over 90% classification outputs. Here, I wanted to show you differences between different subjects. So you don't have much time to go through this, but this is the weights of the, if, of the features for one model for subject A and for subject B. And you can see that the colors look similar distributions. I won't go in detail. So this is all the features and all the re-references, subset of them at least. And you can see that this two subjects have their models and weights are very comparable. They have yellow on top, followed by blue, followed by yellows and blues and yellows and blues. And they're very similar. So these two subjects could use the same model probably and get good classification accuracy. But this subject has a very different pattern. Here it's blue on top and not in yellow here. And you can see they're very different. So this subject classification using these two subjects model would not be very good. So this approach allows us to try to find groups of people that you can then separate and say, okay, these groups, I may be able to use this model for. So that might help reduce your training time. But for ourselves, we still find the training it takes so little time. We prefer to do training for each individual for each day because on a day-to-day -day basis, you may change how much sleep did you have last night? What did you just eat? All these things can affect your physiology. So we prefer to do a training session just before the, uh, if possible, just before the task that we're measuring. There are a number of uh, tasks that we've done here uh, that we've shown that we can track, again, the difficulty of workload uh, or engagement. And this is a simulation where you had to track uh, flights and planes on the simulation. Here we had a UAV task. Again, you can see that engagement can be discriminated into almost a plateau versus workload. And here we see something interesting where when workload gets too high, people do strategy changes. So that's interesting to, to you can see that. We can use these types of approaches to either automatically adapt the system or to provide this information to a, to a supervisor that can make decisions through resource allocation based upon the person's workload. So you can see operator A versus operator two have different mental workloads. This one is overloaded. Uh, operator two is overloaded. Operator one is not. Hey, let's give some more work to operator one and reduce the load of operator two. So you can resource a task, um, lever, lever, uh, lever, balance your resources by looking at mental workload. Uh, we can also look at expertise levels uh, for educational applications. This was a very, very small proof of concept study we did for TSA. So we brought in some experts, uh, baggage screeners that can look at these x-rays and we trained uh, some interns to get to passing grade on a test, on a training course and pass the test to do x-ray screening. And then when we looked at their uh, mental outputs, we could see that one of those um, uh, interns was performing fabulously. He was performing just as well as the experts on all metrics, how fast, how correct. But when we looked at his mental workload, he was through the roof, whereas the experts were really breezing through this task. This other subject, you could tell from their performance that they were not at the same level as an expert, but this one performed as well. So this can allow us to develop efficient training paradigms for automatic teaching it can help reduce the time once somebody reaches an expertise level to move them to the next stage or make the soft training harder or easier or re-engage them. Um, we can do more sensitive workload subtypes. For us, we did this by integrating FNIR. So we were able to break down the mental workload into visual, auditory, cognitive, and psychomotor. And so we could track those individually. And the biggest challenge here was to set up training files training paradigms that could be individually visual, individually auditory, individual cognitive, individually psychomotor tasks. That was very difficult, but that's what we had to do to train these models. And once we had those models trained, we could then validate them and, and run different tasks and see which task has what percentage of mental workload, and which types of mental workload, and that can help you in designing equipment and designing user interfaces, see how you can shift resources from one mental stage uh, one mental workload type to another. That's for neuroergonomics. We did a number of other military validations, um, either seated or stationary or sleep deprivation. And again, we can get high classification accuracies when you use the right um, training models. We can be insensitive to noise, so we can add noise, we can reduce electrodes, we can play all these games and see the limits and uh, capabilities of the system. 
We had one of our customers do a really exciting uh, work with hypoxia monitoring. So they had um, pilots wearing the mask to kind of make them in artificially hypoxic conditions, and they could use Q states to determine how hypoxic they were. And they could they show they saw the differences between individualized models getting you know 96% classification accuracy versus the normative models being not as reliable as the um, individual models. And most importantly, they could look back at the features and see that they were very commonly getting features that were reported in the literature as being related to hypoxic states. Um, and very interestingly, they also found that the most common feature was one that wasn't reported in the literature. And that's a new feature for them to kind of explore. And that was the most common and sort of for salient feature across individuals. So that allowed them to do a next study that is going to be published this January, where they use their own algorithms. But they, they based them a little bit, uh, you know, they, they extracted features uh, using principal components. They use different types of uh, artificial intelligence. And they were getting specificity and sensitivities that are quite high and quite impressive using EEG features. So these things. And you can build on them. There are many different algorithms to use, and you can do a wide range of applications. Okay, your take home messages start with clean data, garbage in, garbage out. When you are training, it is especially important to have very clean, uh, relevant physiological signals. Train with as much data as you can. Try to avoid the overfitting, to avoid overfitting data. Use as many ground truths so that you, it's as possible so that you're convinced that you have a real state that you're looking at, use context relevant training. So that means that if you are going to be doing something in a simulator, do the training in the simulator. And I can answer, give you more information about that in the questions and answers time. Um, validate your models and pilot studies before you spend a whole lot of time running a lot of subjects. Review the selected features, make sure that they make sense, make sure you didn't overfit the data. And be careful to avoid artifacts. Uh, be careful to avoid um, outliers in your training data and be careful from overfitting. So that's it for uh, today's webinar. I'll take your questions. I will thank you for taking the time to be with us. We have had a number of other webinars in the past. You're welcome to look over those. And we are preparing for our next one in January. So please email us if you have any questions or any requests for the future webinars. Thank you again, and I'll now take questions. And thanks, everyone, again, for attending. Feel free to send in any questions into the Q&A, or you can send them in the chat. Uh, a lot of good questions so far. We'll go ahead and get started on some. Uh, the first one is, is it possible to obtain a separation of states if the cognitive task is neither too difficult nor too easy? I have doubt whether the algorithm will be able to separate such states if the cognitive tasks have an intermediate level. All right, Cameron, I'm going to have to ask you to reread that again. It broke up a little bit. Uh, is it possible to obtain a separation of states if the cognitive task is neither too difficult nor too easy? Having doubt whether the algorithm will be able to separate such states if it is a um, intermediate level. Okay, so that's a great question. So indeed, um, if the states are too close and they're not separable, um, Q states won't be able to separate them. So if it tries to, you may be overfitting your data. So that's something you have to check for. And so in the case of the uh, column addition uh, examples that I showed you earlier on, you may have noticed that the easy column additions, um, they were solved in two seconds. The person actually had 20 seconds to solve them. And we did that because what we found was when we allowed them to solve the easy problems as fast as they could, they would go through them very, very fast. And that would be a high mental workload. And we weren't able to get good separation between the high, the difficult three column addition in the single column addition because they were just doing so many of them. So what we did is we decided to pace them, to give them 20 seconds to solve them. And if they solved them in two seconds, then they had to wait for the next one. So in some way I'd say, well, wait a minute, now they're not doing anything. Well, yeah, that's, that's the purpose of an easy task. You have resources left to do other things. So by our definition for this task, that is an easy task that was solved easily. And now they have more time to do other things. So you can give them more tasks. The task overall, the 20 seconds will be low, even though in the first two seconds it might have spiked. But because we are smoothing and we're doing a running average across uh, every five seconds, um, we end up seeing that as a, as a low state. In the case of the uh, hard, it was you can now separate the two. 
So it's important to have states that you can separate um, for your training. And if you want them to be as far apart as possible, as I mentioned, if you go too, more, too hard, people will tend to switch strategies and go to something that's a little easier. So you want to titrate and find what is that hardest point in which they're working the hardest. Because these algorithms are very good at interpolating the data, but they're not very good at extrapolating the data. So if you know the extremes of the low and the high, you can fit data in between them. But if you get data where it's harder, it's just going to plateau max out and say, okay, you know, I'm hard, but you won't know that this was actually harder. So when we set up our task for easy and hard, we actually run for each subject, we do a titration curve where we increase the difficulty to see where is it that's too hard for them. And then we adjust. And typically we try to adjust the task so we can get a task that's sort of on average difficult enough for everybody and easy enough for everybody on the easy level. All right, uh, next question. Is there a common model for most people or a large population? Great question. So the, the, the figures that I showed you of subject A, B, and C, where I showed you um, subject um, one subject versus the other, uh, those, those allow you to um, get a sense of how much variance there is between people. Uh, oops. I'm gonna try to show you a figure that shows you uh, distribution between different people. So I'm gonna share that figure with you. So in this case, um, for this study, we had 18 subjects and we found that when we looked at the features of nine of those, uh, of, of those subjects, we found that nine subjects had very similar feature sets. So those, those people would likely use each other's models and get good classification accuracies. There's another subset, there was five sub people. Those people, when we looked at their weights, the classifiers were using EMG-based features. So those people, when the game got very hard, they tensed up, they're holding the mouse tightly, their neck tensed up. So QSAID said, hey, you know what? I can tell the difference between these guys just by looking at EMG-based features. And that's what it used preferentially. And then we had four other people that had, each one of them had their own model that was very different from the others. So what we found is when we grouped all the data into one big, one big normative model, the classification accuracy went down. And yet when we took each individual model and allowed them to run that, and then we looked at the classification accuracy across all of those people, running, each running their own model, we had classification accuracies over 90%. So we went from 70 to 75 on the normative model to about 90 or above classification accuracy for individuals' models. So that is not to say that that is for every case this way. I think it's important to spend the time to look at the features, see if you can find salient features that are across all individuals. So that is the effort that um, the group uh, that I showed you doing the hypoxia study uh, did and they were able to identify some features that are common, and then they tried to build on top of that and, and see what they can, um, if they can determine some more um, resistant, resilient um, metrics. So it's not to say that it's not possible, you just have to be careful that some tasks, some people have different brains, perform differently, think differently, so you may need to allow yourself to train individual models. So. In our case, it's wow. easy and fast to train a model, so it doesn't bother us too much. But in some cases where you need a, a lot of data, uh, you may be trying to create normative models there. All right, so just a couple more questions here. For anyone who has any more questions, feel free to send them in the uh, Q&A or the chat before we finish up. Uh, we'll get through these last couple questions. Um, the next one is, do you have any comparative studies for wireless versus wired EEG data acquisition and processing? Okay, good question. So for us, um, there isn't much a difference between wired and wireless data because the data is digitized on the headset. So we have amplifiers uh, at each of the sensors, they're active sensors, uh, almost all of them, and they get, um, the signals get sent to the headset where they get digitized and then they get transmitted. So the data between wireless and wired is about the same. Uh, wireless just means that you can get about and walk without a tether holding you back. So what tends to happen is people can move. Our systems, if you can see our other webinars, you can see how resistant we are to motion artifacts. Uh, we're, quite, we're quite good uh, at that. So the 
there are limits, however. So if you jump or if you run, you'll see some artifacts. And that's what you might see a difference in terms of um, wired versus wireless. And so again, when depending on how you're doing your processing, uh, QStates has some basic uh, abilities to reject epochs that are too noisy. Uh, some people might um, do manual artifacting. We have separately, that I'm not talking about it today, artifact removal algorithms that can be applied beforehand if you really want to reduce artifacts. But in, in our case, for our data, it's about the same. Uh, this brings me to the case, however, of why is it important to use context-relevant uh, training? And uh, we had a group, the, one of the first groups we trained. They were in Australia, and I went out and trained them, and they, they really brilliantly understood QStates and how to use it and how to work it, um, uh, how to play some clever tricks with it. And then I left, and by the time I arrived back uh, to San Diego, um, lots of time had spent by, but I received two emails, which were eight hours apart. The first one said, we tried it in our tank simulator, and it doesn't work. Eight hours later, there was a second email that said, never mind, we figured it out. So what they had done, the first one, they had trained the classifier with data recorded outside the simulator. So they were doing these column addition tasks outside the tank simulator. And they trained the model. And then they went into the simulator, which is a tank simulator, which is vibrating and moving. And they tried to repeat the tasks and classify. And it didn't work very well. When they went back and trained using data recorded inside the simulator, then QState saw this NEC EMG data in both the training with a high state and the low state and said, hey, this EMG, NEC EMG is irrelevant. It's you know, not a salient feature. It's there in both the high and low state. I'm just going to ignore it and set low weights on it or maybe deflate it and get rid of it. Now, when they did their classification inside uh, their verification validation um, classifications, they got great results. So it's important to use the training data in a context that's relevant to what you're actually going to be applying your classification on. All right, and the uh, last question that we have, unless anyone wants to send anything else in, uh, is the, uh, how many, is there a num an ideal number of files or an ideal length for the training data? Good, a very good question. And there isn't an ideal. I mean, the more data you have, the better uh, you will be, especially uh, to avoid overfitting um, your data. We tend to recommend not to use less than one minute of data, especially when you're using some features like heart rate uh, variability, which requires about 20 seconds for some of the features to start getting data, after which they then update every two seconds, but you end up needing quite a bit of data to, to train. So we usually use on ourselves, we use a minute to two minutes, depending on the complexity of the data and how much um, time our experiment is. We don't want to spend half an hour or an hour in training. We want to be able to run our experiments. So you want to minimize the training data. The other thing that that relates to is the question that was previously asked is the separability between the two tasks. So the closer the two tasks are to each other, the more training data you might need. Uh, if you have um, data that are very easy to separate, such as eyes open versus eyes closed, you can probably do that with even less than a minute of data. You can do that probably with 30 seconds of data. Uh, but it just depends on how separable the two uh, states are. And that also ties back into another question that was asked. Um, if you were trying to do something where you needed to train a model and then assess people, so you wanted to have a depression model, you may not have the luxury of having a person pre-depression, pre post-depression. If you do, or TBI, if you have the person pre-TBI, post-TBI, great. But if you don't, you only have the person post-TBI, you do need to try to create normative models that allow you to either account for different variances in people, so maybe morning models, evening models, young people, models based upon age, models based upon gender, models based upon IQ, or, or whatever else, to try to identify groups and categories of people for whom the model will then appropriately classify. So you have to be careful about creating a model for the entire world and then trying to use that to classify their TBI. And some people might have had TBIs that they didn't know about. So again, you have to be careful about the training data. The more training data you have, the better. You just have to be careful about what it is you're putting in there. All right.
righty. I think that covers all the questions that we have right now. If anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to send them in. Otherwise, thank you all for your attendance and your time. And I uh, hope you were able to learn a lot about the uh, Q-States and our machine learning algorithms. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to us. Hopefully uh, we'll hear from you and your applications and um, uh, how you're solving this uh, challenge of getting some meaning out of the EG data or other physiological sensors. Thanks again.